Into the Fog, Part 1, What We Become An original short story by Charlie C.C. C. Thomas Day 1 Light and color flickered over Michael's shut eyes. It swirled, falling into him like lightning, drawn out in the eternity between one second and another. He gasped and snapped open his eyes, head jolting up and scanning his bedroom through the throb in his skull. He sat up and hissed, cradling his head as he slid his legs over the edge of the bed and walked to the bathroom. When he finished his morning routine, he passed the doorway and scratched his bare chest with a yawn, stretching his skinny frame before he changed from boxers to pajamas and a clinging tank top. He turned, smacking his mouth in anticipation of the coffee wafting up from downstairs and furrowed his brow as he looked through the windows either side his bed. The morning light was dull and filtered like it were overcast at midday without a strip of orange or yellow from sunrise. He checked the digital clock, but it said the right time. He grabbed his watch from the light wood nightstand, and it said the same as the clock. He breathed a short chuckle and shrugged, strapping the watch around his left wrist as he made for the bedroom door and slid downstairs, gray and blue flannel pants swaying around skinny legs. He bounded into the kitchen with another yawn, scratching his eye as he passed the dining table for the coffee station his wife had insisted on keeping. He stopped pot frozen over his mug as he stared through the world to the memory of her smile. He sighed past the memory and made himself a cup with too much sugar before sipping and letting the warmth fill him. He shivered and took another sip before he turned and sat at the table, keeping the lights off as he took out his cell phone to scan the news. He furrowed his brows when the internet wouldn't load, closing the browser and reopening it to the same error page. He looked at the signal no bars, and turned to the router on the shelves under the little television mounted to the wall between the dining area and the kitchen. There was no internet. There was no service. He took the remote from the basket in the middle of the table and turned on the television to a black screen. He tried changing the stations, tried working with the menu, even got up to tap the screen and stand, arms crossed, as he glared at the useless thing. But in the end, he turned it off with a defeated sigh moving from his wide stance back to his coffee for another sweet sip. He checked his watch, humming that Debbie still wasn't down. You're no morning girl, but you never miss making pancakes. He finished the last of his coffee and went to the sink, glad the caffeine had gotten rid of his headache, but even more confused as he stared through the window over the sink. The light came from everywhere, filling the thick, misty air that half enveloped his backyard. He leaned forward and laughed, flicking left and right, but the privacy fence was nowhere to be seen. When's the last time we got fog like this? He asked himself before calling over his shoulder. Debbie, baby, you gotta come see this. He pulled back and went for the back door, shuffling over the screened in the lanai, squinting his eyes as he stopped in the middle of the dewy grass. The humidity sank into him, condensing on his arm hair as he waved his hand through the mist with a flat smile. He looked all around, arms dangling at his side as he searched for the fence's shadow. It wasn't more than fifteen yards away, but there was only fog. Well, good thing it's Sunday, he said as he went back inside, wiping his feet on the mat before heading upstairs. He smirked and took a wide stance, stomping loudly as he crept up to his daughter's room, door white as snow with a swirling brass handle that shone against the deep forest green of the upstairs. "'What is that I smell?' he said in an ogreish voice. "'I smell the blood of a little girl that hasn't gotten out of bed.' He stomped louder, paced getting faster as he approached the door until he was half sprinting in place and creaking it open. He slid his face sideways through the crack with cartoonishly pursed lips and high-arching eyebrows as he sniffed loudly. "'Yes, there she is. Why isn't she up?' He pushed the door open and stood upright, crossing his arms as he faced her white and pink bed and mess of red and yellow throw pillows. Does she want to miss pancakes? He tilted his head, waiting for her to move, to jump up with a groggy smile and meet him with a hug, to groan and tell him that she was tired, but there was nothing. He smirked and walked over, 
the scant clutter that she forgot to put away last night before bed, and sat on her sheets, the ogre gone. You feeling okay, kiddo? He pulled the covers back and flicked his eyes over the empty bed, brows furrowing as he turned to the door, half expecting to find her standing there. He rose and called for her again from outside of her bedroom before a smirk crawled up his face and he turned to her closet. He tiptoed over, past her dark wood vanity and dresser, past the single window letting in the foggy light, until he stood before her double-door closet. I wonder where she could be hiding. He smiled and took the handles, turning them and flinging the doors open as he took a wide stance and playfully growled. Gotcha! His clawed hands drooped like his expression as he scanned her empty closet, pushing himself up to his feet and calling for Debbie, looking under her bed, racing to the upstairs bathroom, down the stairs hoping to find her pulling open the fridge to mock him for being so worried. He ran to the living room, the garage, sprinted up and down the basement, forgetting on the first pass to even turn the lights on, and ran out the front door. He called her, his heart racing as he stopped in the middle of his yard and spun, cursing at the fog. He ran bony fingers through short hair and shut his eyes, reminding himself to breathe before they reopened and pierced the mist like steel. Joe should be up by now, he thought, and pulled out his phone, dialing his number. It rang three times, then chimed that the number wasn't in service and to try again later. He cursed and tried it four more times as he paced in front of the wood porch. He tried three other people, five of his neighbors, Devin, Debbie's friend's father, always the same message. He shouted and slung the phone into the grass with a stream of curses before he half screamed for his daughter. He huffed and dug up the phone, dialing 911 as he sprinted for the sidewalk beyond his fence. One ring, two rings. He slowed to open the gate, and his foot fell through empty air. His other leg buckled, then went taut as he twisted to his side and slid over the edge of a hole. He rounded and pulled himself up until he could lay on his back, cursing as he pushed up onto his elbows. He stared at the hole his legs still hung from, ignoring the phone telling him the number was out of service. He followed the edge of the hole one way, then the other, and never found the end. A cliff. His eyes went wide when it finally sunk in and he cursed a mantra as he flailed backward, spinning onto his belly and yanking his legs back onto solid ground. He crawled forward and flipped, falling to his side and staring at the shadowed outline of the cliff's edge in the middle of his front yard, half swallowed by the mist. He heaved, frozen, heart pounding as wind tussled his pajama pants, eyes glued to the edge of the world. There wasn't an earthquake, right? He thought. Then he blinked and pushed himself up until he sat straight, legs pulled together beneath him. He swallowed, wide eyes tracing the rim as he leaned forward trying to see over the edge. He was too far away. So he huffed a scared laugh and sat back, shaking his head, standing and walking back up the concrete driveway. He stopped short of his Volkswagen Beetle, staring through the garage doors, fingers tapping on his thigh before he chewed his cheek and spun on his heels. He sprinted, forcing himself forward before he lost the nerve, breath coming faster with each step, eyes wider as the edge came closer. He stopped a foot away, careful not to get too close in case it was tapered too thin and would break under his weight. He swallowed, eyes up into the endless fog, hands kneading together in front of him as he breathed fast and hard, shaking his hands and flinging his eyes down in one go. The fog was thick all around him, blocking off line of sight not ten or fifteen feet away, but the land his house was on cut straight down in a jagged wall of dirt, root sprigs, electrical lines, and pipe. He clumsily put his hands behind himself and clasped them together as he gulped on a dry throat and traced the cliff. He walked right, keeping slow and flicking up and down to make sure that he didn't walk off the edge as he circled to the side of his house, around the back, the other side, and back to the front. He stopped at a cell phone, blinking down at it and staring before he remembered what it was and put it back in his pocket, dirt and all. He stood straight and licked his lips, eyes craning into the fog and finding nothing but the same shifting streams of vapor. 
He backed up the drive as a breeze came from above, growing until it nearly pushed him down. He grabbed a hold of his car and looked up for the source. A plane? A helicopter? A giant, monstrous flying thing? Nothing would be a surprise, apart from simple wind. The downward gale slammed into him until he had to crawl on hands and knees. One of the trees in the flower bed by his door, rocking and moaning from the weight of it. He pushed open the door and rolled in, looking back through as the gale altered to come from the side, pulling leaves and scraps of paper into the grass. He froed his brow at the garbage but slammed the door shut with his foot, the howl still echoing through the house as the window shook. He swallowed, mouth open as he pushed himself up and called out for his daughter again, his voice getting lower each time he did it as he stopped at the foot of the stairs. She's not here, he whispered, chest aching and mind flitting between ideas fast as his eyes did the rails of the stairs. Maybe she was supposed to stay at a friend's house and I just forgot. Yeah. He failed to convince himself, but saying it almost made it real. There were words that he could imagine someone else saying, a lie he could almost believe, at least enough to push it to the back of his mind. He looked around and wandered into the kitchen, standing with his back to the fridge facing the sink. What am I supposed to do? He thought aloud. It, it's not even possible. I'm on a pillar. My house is standing on a giant pillar in the middle of nothing. He chuckled, arms coming up and squeezing himself around the middle as the chuckle became a laugh, became a cackle. Tears rolled down his cheeks as he staggered to the side and leaned over the countertop by the stove. He doubled over as the laughter left him aching and slowly turned to whimpers, then sobs. He heaved over the counter, stomach lurching coffee into his mouth. He swallowed it back down and breathed, sliding down the cabinets until he was on the floor. He panted, trying and failing to steady his breathing. His arms came up around his body, then his legs as he curled into a seated ball. Then he sprawled himself open and shut, and then open again, the streaks of dirt, mud, and grass ignored on the faux hardwood. Tears welled and fell and dried again, over and over. Minutes, hours passed as he sat there with dry, unmoving eyes and a blank mind like a corpse. Then something scratched the air. It was quick and hollow like something was clawing at a door. Then came the whimper and whine and bark. Michael's eyes whirled to the door to the basement, then passed, down the short hall to the garage. He smiled and scrambled up, slipping three times before he found his feet and ran to the door, pushing it open as sore eyes found the giddy black lab panting and standing on her hind legs to reach his chest. Michael smiled and fell to his knees, arms wrapping around her with a silent sob, nearly falling back with her weight. He leaned forward and let her lick his face, laughing as she jumped back and barked louder and louder and pranced in place. Are you hungry, Blue? He asked, sitting back on his heels. She barked three times, panting with smiling eyes as he stood and walked over to her dog food, Blue following him the whole way. He filled her food bowl and sighed at her empty water, picking up the bowl and tapping it as she scarfed down her kibble. He sighed and went to the sink tapping the bowl one last time before he set his hand on the faucet. Worth a try, he whispered. Then he turned the handle and water fell into the sink. His eyes went wide and he shoved the bowl under the water, shutting it off quickly and running into the garage. He set Blue's bowl down and pulled down a plastic tote, dumping the old Christmas lights onto the floor and returning to the kitchen to pull two massive pitchers down from a top shelf. He turned the water on and filled one pitcher, then replaced it with the other, and emptied the first into the tote as Blue's nails clacked on the hardwood. He turned around to find her watching from the doorway with a tilted head before she licked her lips. If we're not connected to water, whatever's in the lines is all we got, he said, switching back and forth as he returned his focus, waiting for the pressure to fall. I'll have to find a way to get more water, maybe from the fog, maybe I could 
filter our urine if I have to. He flicked back and forth between the sink and blue before he sighed and remembered that he was talking to a dog. But when the tote was almost full and the water pressure still hadn't fallen, he stopped, turned the water off, and stared at the small pool that he'd made in the middle of his kitchen. Maybe I'm wrong, he said and turned around to find Blue was gone. He chuckled. <laughs> at least that hasn't changed. Then returned to the water. There's no water connection. Come to think of it, there's no power either. But none of this makes sense. He turned until he found the kitchen light switch and closed the distance, finger poised beneath, and flicked it up. The lights blazed on. He whirled around and looked up, brows furrowing as he lowered his gaze and looked blindly around the room, shuffling his thoughts. That doesn't make sense. There's, there's no power. I saw the exposed lines. Nothing should work. He chuckled. And yet here I am. I'll take a miracle when it comes, I guess. He sighed, and his stomach roared. Well, since Debbie isn't here, since she's at her friend's house, how about I make us some pancakes, Blue? He looked past the foyer to the living room where Blue lay as she perked her ears. Pancakes? He repeated, and she lifted her head with a yawning stretch, sauntering into the kitchen. Day Two Michael woke to the sound of his alarm at 6 a.m. like he did every Monday. He brushed his teeth, showered, and slipped into comfortable jeans and a white undershirt like he did every workday. He descended the stairs, inhaling the smell of perking coffee, and strode through the kitchen for his too-sugary drink like he always did. He hummed, ignoring the slowly growing light from the windows and the swirling fog beyond. He sipped his coffee with a roll of his eyes and stretched. He popped his back, his neck, his fingers, and toes, and padded, coffee in hand, to the garage, where Blue lay half asleep with heavy eyes and perking ears as he passed. He hummed something low under his breath between steaming sips, and filled a cup of dog food only to turn and find Blue standing with expectant brown eyes and wagging tail. He smiled and shook the cup, Blue shifting from one front paw to the other. Would you like breakfast? He pouted at her as she panted. I can't hear you. She quirked her head as they stared, her mouth ajar with the tip of her tongue poking out before he rolled his eyes and shook the cup one more time. She straightened and barked, bouncing on her front legs a few times as he pointed to her with a smirk and filled her food dish. He returned the cup and gauged how much was left in the bag, checking if he had a spare and finding the empty spot on the shelf where it would have been. He sighed. I'll have to go to the store soon. Then he stopped, coffee almost to his lip as he blinked and remembered the sheer cliff cutting his house off from an empty, foggy oblivion. He cleared his tightening throat and sipped from his coffee, ignoring the burn as it sat too long on his tongue and turning mechanically on his heels to walk back into the kitchen and sit at the dining table. He stared into his mug, tilting it on the tabletop and watching the liquid stay level toying with the edge of the cup until it was just at the rim before setting it flat. He sat back, pulling his phone out and cursing when he opened it. No service, he reminded himself, and slammed his phone down. He sighed. I probably shouldn't do that. Can't replace this thing anymore. He chuckled, eyes trailing on the black screen as he tapped the edges. He leaned back in his chair, and the chuckle grew into a snicker, a laugh. A cackle. Then, still cackling, he stood, leaving his coffee for the back door. It swung open on silent hinges as he stumbled out and stared at the lightning pattern of swirling mist, layer after endless layer that swallowed the unseen world and crept up his yard until he couldn't see the edge. The edge. That blasted edge. The one that he couldn't see. The one he should have fallen off. The one that had no right to be there. Blue bounded out the door and barked as she passed him and his cackling, sprinting through the yard. His fingers scraped over his skull, wide eyes jutting out into the heavens, but the laughter sputtered out as he stared up at nothing and the fog and the ever-present light. 
He chuckled like he wanted the mad cackling to start all over again, but it only quieted back to breath, then again, and once more, before he looked down at the back half of Blue, sniffing at the world's edge. Blueberry! He shouted, and his voice cracked as he launched forward. She spun around and bounded for him, worried eyes searching his face, sniffing him with her tail down and wagging, unsure if she'd done something wrong or if she needed to comfort him. He stopped in front of her, stroking her head with a sad smile as he bent and kissed her nose. She licked it tentatively, lifting her paw for him to hold as her tail slowly lifted into a wild wag. I can't have anything happen to you, girl. He petted her head and stood straight as she licked her chops and watched him wipe his face of slobber. He faced the endless fog and swallowed, the tickle of the laugh rising in the back of his throat before he whimpered a breath and quickly cleared it. Come on, Blue, let's go back inside. I need to make myself some breakfast before we get started. Doing what, exactly? He thought. I... I'll figure that out as I go. Later, Michael sat on the couch and tapped his foot as the movie played, something with action, explosions, and plenty of noise and thrill to let him forget about the eternity outside for just another hour and a half. But the bright lights, the violence, the women, nothing kept his eye on the television. Blue was more invested, and her eyes were half-lidded in his lap. The explosions were dull, the dialogue was a dream, the plots and schemes and shouting, it was just buzzing in the back of his ears that became ringing as he stared out the window across from the couch. The fog twisted in the bright nearly midday light, swirling and rippling like churning water in zero-g. Cloud after white-gray cloud rolled over the house, covering the yard six times before the movie credits rolled. The vapor swam around itself like it was alive, the flyer and air all at once. Like it wanted to taste the paint on the house, the grass in his yard, the tires on his car, like it wanted to grope its way inside and see what else there was to gobble up. It looked languid and calm and hypnotizing, but it was hungry, he knew. It was starving. It ate the world, he thought and it saved me for dessert. He swallowed and jumped when the ringing silence burst with the theme music from the movie menu. Blue sat upright and looked around, hair on end, until she realized it was just Michael. He half chuckled and calmed her, and himself, petting her nape and head. He stood up and popped the DVD out for another, a thriller, murder mystery he hadn't seen since his wife brought it home. He stopped before shutting the DVD case, then snapped it closed, studying the cover, the protagonist on one side, the antagonist on the other, and all the rest around. He swiped his thumb across the old plastic, sad smile creeping up his face as he shut his eyes and found himself sitting beside her, his arm around her shoulder, a bowl of popcorn in his lap, their bodies warm together under the blanket. He lifted the DVD and smelt it. It wasn't her scent, just old worn plastic, but it was the smell of her favorite movie when she broke the seal of the packaging, and it led him down the path to the smell of the couch and her perfume and moisturizer that she put on every night. It led him to the feel of her hands, to the brush of her lips and taste of her mouth. It led him to the feel of her pulse quicken under his fingertips as he brushed her skin, that one that matched his own. He creaked his eyes open and the world blurred through tears that he wiped away with the same sad smile. He stood straight and lilted his head back to stare at the ceiling and breathe, chuckling despite himself and letting it all flow out on a long, slow exhale before he set the movie in the player and returned to Blue's side with a quick peck to her head. He smelled her and Debbie flashed behind his eyes. He squeezed them shut as the previews rolled. She was so young, but already stood to his chest, tall like her father, her black hair long and in a thick braid, her smile full of wide gaps that she'd grow into but she was self-conscious of. 
He took a long breath and let blue scent settle on the back of his throat as he melded with the couch breath coming faster as his heart raced, eyes tightening until he saw stars over his daughter's laughing face. But then she wasn't laughing. She wept and ran out of her bedroom with all the alarm of a five-year-old who saw a monster in their closet despite her twelve years. She moved in slow motion, voice echoing and reverberating like it was far off. She screamed for him as she raced downstairs and fell, cracking her bones on the steps. His breath came in pants as his ears pulsed with his heartbeat, fists balled in his lap as Blue shifted and whimpered low, setting her head on his chest. But he didn't open his eyes. He had to watch, had to see what happened, because he might never see her again otherwise. She rolled on the floor, crying and wincing as she stood, thin like her father, and hobbled to the front door, struggling to pull it open as the fog crept over the neighborhood. It swallowed the houses, their neighbors, the streets, light poles, cars, everything. People screamed like their guts were torn out through their mouths. Animals cried and whimpered and howled high and short like they'd all been run over by a car back first. His heart pounded, ears ringing as he flung his eyes open, banishing the image of her running down the yard and into the street to escape the fog. He stood shoving Blue aside as he stormed through the front door, gasping for breath as he shook and bellowed up into the misty eternity. One loud scream after another, after another, until his voice was gone and the hot tears were dry. He squeaked out something else, a breath or a shout or nothing at all, and let his arms dangle, let his body slump and shuffled back inside like a huffing, walking corpse. That night he lay in bed in his clothes, blue beside him and whimpering as he stared up at the ceiling, heartbeat slow, eyes half-lidded, body begging for sleep even as his mind raced and beat itself with one thought after another. He wiped his nose and yawned, laying over the blankets and covers as he pulled off his belt and dropped it to the floor. His hand found blue's head as he scratched between her ears, shushing her slow and gentle. It's okay, girl. I'm okay. He smirked and let a bitter, breathy laugh puff out of his nose. That's a lie. But I will be. I'll be okay, babe. I just need to sleep. He yawned and turned on to his side, facing Blue and smiling as she tentatively licked his face and scooted closer. He shut his eyes and put his arm around her, thumb absently stroking her fur until she sighed and let her full weight sink into the bed. He did the same, but sleep didn't come. There was no Morpheus, no Hypnos, no rest or reprieve. It had eaten them all. There was just the fog outside his window, waiting, watching, and wanting. Day Three Michael sat on the edge of his bed, Shirt sticking from the dried sweat, he squinted at the lightning fog outside his window. Fingers laced together between his legs, mouth slack but shut, eyes flicking around the shifting fog. But the rest of him, the rest of him was stone still, sitting there minute after minute, hour after hour, until the pale light of the morning grew to overcast day. He found his digital clock, then the wristwatch, and finally the timer that he'd set on his phone. They were all normal, the right time between all of them, and even the right increase of light between six and ten. But how could there be light without a sun? Where did the light come from? Michael stood, joints creaking and popping as he went and stretched, eyes still fixed to the fog through the window. He stopped in front of it, hand resting on the glass as he peered through the vapor. Something moved behind the clouds. He froze, eyes wide as they tracked the speckled shadow weave between the clouds. Closer, then further, gone, then returned. He licked his lips, hugging closer to the glass despite the cold sweat dripping down his back. It moved like a shapeless body, a mass of shadow blocking the backlight. He opened the window and let in the cool breeze to lean out closer, 
But as he watched, mouth agape, the shadow burst through the fog into view. Birds. Dozens of little birds flocked together between the clumps of swimming mist, shimmering blackish blue and green and red, all at once, like little holograms. He furrowed his brows, grinning as they moved in unison, cresting in massive waves and diving down below the edge of his world. He blinked and imagined that they were specks of a larger beast poking through the fabric of our space, the tiniest parts of it visible, while the rest stayed hidden uncaring of him. Then they rushed back through the fog, singing and cawing with different voices as if they were different species of bird. They circled the house three times before settling on the lawn and the shrubs. He chuckled, wondering what it would be like to fly, until one of the birds lighted on the roof to the side of the window. He froze, his smile dropping as he swallowed and stared at it. It was red, like a robin, but bigger, with flecks of yellow as it turned. And its coat wasn't soft. It was hard as a carapace and jagged as scales. Its eyes were inky black and looked everywhere at once, dumb yet too intelligent, lazy yet watchful. It tilted its head and spread its wings, showing the twisted, wrinkly belly and sides that stretched into membranous wings beneath the plumage. It twisted its head like an owl until it found Michael's face. Then it cawed, whirled to face him, and lifted its wings with a nasal hiss, bearing all of its glistening teeth. Michael jumped back and slammed the window shut, closing the blinds soon after as he stumbled sideways into the bed and fell onto the mattress. He panted. Watching the windows, the air went still and quiet. Then disjointed choruses echoed again with flapping wings, covering the house before the birds brought their voices further and further away. He looked at Blue on the other side of the bed and slowly reached for her, stroking her bristled fur until it settled, and her snarl became the normal, worried expression she'd taken to ever since they woke up in the fog. A few hours later, after shutting all the blinds and making sure no birds could get in, thank God we never had a chimney put in, he stood in his kitchen, writing down everything there was to eat and how much of it. After putting everything back, he moved on to the fridge, then the extra food they kept in the basement, then the garage. Three weeks, Blue, Michael said, not caring if the dog was in the room or not. Less for you. Good news is, we won't starve to death right away. Bad news is, we'll starve to death. He clicked and re-clicked the pen a couple of times as he stared up and down at the metal shelves full of useless trinkets and decorations, nodding and turning to find Blue sitting in front of the doorway. Second good news, he pointed the pen at her, and she perked her ears. We won't be trapped here forever. Eventually we'll die. He smiled almost genuinely as he approached and passed her to slap the notebook down on the dining table and fall into the chair. Is it too early to drink? He asked the heir. He shrugged with a sigh. Does it matter when I'm the only human alive? He waved his hands in the air and pushed himself back up to pull the bottle of gin from the freezer and carefully pour a serving into a glass, sipping lovingly, only to come away empty. He cursed, sighed, and carefully poured one more drink before returning the bottle to the freezer and pulling the curtain away from the kitchen window. No birds, he thought. Maybe I can sit outside on the lanai for a few minutes and not get eaten. But, thirty minutes and an empty glass of gin later, Michael was on his hands and knees, driving a plastic stake into the turf a yard from the edge of his world with a tote of Christmas lights beside. He set the mallet aside when the stake was deep enough and wrapped the string of lights around it before moving on to the next stake a few yards away, and again, and again, until he looped the house with stakes. Then he looped the lights as many times as he could and ran the cord to the lanai and the extension cord near the back door. He plugged it in and the fog lit up with white, flashing, multicolored bulbs. No falling over the edge, he said with hands on his hips, panting. At least, not by forgetting where it is. 
He smiled and looked down at Blue, asleep in her outdoor dog bed. He raised his eyebrows and motioned to the light with dirty hands. Eh? What do you think? She grumbled something and stared at him, like she didn't understand, but her tail wagged. He gave a frowning smile and nodded, returning his hands to his hips. I'll take it. Day four. Michael leaned on the railing in front of his daughter's bedroom, tears silently trekking his cheeks as he stared at the perfect wood and the glint of foggy oblivion in the brassy knob. The fog flooded in his mind, like it had the rest of the world, and he shut his eyes, felling more tears as he turned his head away from the window in front of the hall, mouth twisting as he fought the sob in his chest. He turned up his head, half-empty bottle of rum at his lips, stained undershirt sliding on the rail. He caught himself with his bare foot and chugged, the burn forgotten, the spice irrelevant, the warmth and haze seeping into his extremities, an afterthought, if he thought of them at all. Debbie appeared behind his eyes like she had when she was a little girl. Her long hair, a mess, as she sat with her mother on the picnic blanket in the backyard. He opened them, but it didn't matter. The bottle came down, and he slouched, numb fingers squeezing the neck of the rum too hard, the other a frozen claw, as he let go and gasped a sharp, painful breath. It sputtered out of him as wide eyes looked around and broke through the world to the memory of her face. She'd smiled at him that day like she hadn't in so long. It made Debbie so happy even as she watched him from glossy, sunken eyes, even as she smiled from scabbed, dry lips, even as her hollow face rose in a smile, it was the woman that he'd married. He shut his eyes and shook his head as the hand with the bottle smacked the rail to keep from falling, but her face was still there. Bald head covered in a scarf, knitted sweater hiding her bony body. Michael thought, she was skinnier than me when she... when... she... He stood and swung the bottle to his mouth, but the world spun and rushed up to punch him in the back. He sputtered the mouthful of rum over his chest, choking and looking down at the rest of him as he writhed on the floor. He cursed between deep coughs and pushed himself up, pulling his shirt over his shoulders until all that he had on was his black boxers. He pulled and cursed as his arms got stuck. He fell back and cursed again, slapping his feet flat on the hardwood. Then something warm and wet poured on his face and stung his eyes. He shot up with a cry and smacked his head on the railing, cursing as he flailed and covered himself in even more liquid until the shirt finally came off and he found the near-empty bottle of rum dumped out into his shirt. He stared face blank and body still. Then his mouth twitched and his pulse thrummed in his temples. Noises came from him, words and sounds and something like both strung together until nothing made sense. He clambered to his feet and beat his arms against the wooden railing, slamming his feet into the wall opposite, punching and ripping off chunks of drywall. Then he slipped on the rum, dripping from his dirty skin. He cursed and rolled, body numb, as the drops of rum were joined by blood from unknown cuts. He came to his feet, mouth open in a scream as he pounded the bottle onto the floor, twice, three times, four, and the bottom broke away in a shower of glittering shards. He spun, the crunch and stab of glass in his legs barely a tickle, and brought down the broken edge of the bottle into the wall. Then he stopped. He stared. His wide, wild eyes went tame and his snarl quivered into a desperate frown. He pulled the bottle from his daughter's door, wood groaning, and let it slip from his fingers as he lifted shaking hands over the scar. The gash was pale, even against the white paint, with splinters fraying at the edges like an ugly flower. He ran his fingers over the hardwood shards and tried to press them back in as he whispered words that he couldn't hear, but the gouge was still there. The door was still tarnished and lesser and ruined, and it was his fault. He sank until he sat on his heels, 
hands lifeless between his legs, eyes glued to the chunk that he'd taken out of the door. He blinked his tired, sore eyes and sighed, body heaving with the weight of it, before he picked up his fallen shirt and swept up the shards of glass and wood. The heat and cold all drained out of him until he was an empty husk moving on autopilot. Day 7 He sat in the dining room chair, facing the stove and the pots of simmering beans and rice that he'd made himself for dinner. Blue sat in front of him, wagging her tail on the floor as she stared up at him, her brown eyes almost hazel in the overhead lights, fur graying around her mouth. He sat slouched and half-slid out of the seat, legs spread, pajamas old and unwashed, though the washer and dryer still somehow worked like all the rest of the house. He sighed and gave a sad smile as eyes fell on Blue and her sheening black coat. He reached around himself to the table and nearly empty packets of crackers that he'd been giving her as treats. Two left, he said, pulling the salted squares from their packaging and holding them up like cards. Want em? Blue's tail wagged faster, and her mouth fell open in a smiling pant. Michael grinned and sat forward, giving her one and petting her head as she chewed and swallowed. Sorry I didn't get you any treats from the store. You'd have a lot more to eat if I'd gone shopping when I was supposed to. She stared at the other cracker in his hand and licked her chops. All right, but it's the last one, babe. There won't be any more after this. Ever. She flicked up to his eyes for a second, then back to the cracker. He breathed a laugh and held it out for her, smirking as she took it and stood to plate his food. He ignored the freezer and the rum and gin and vodka bottles with what little was left of each. He couldn't finish any for fear that they'd really be gone. Couldn't finish them for fear of what it would say of him. Don't worry, girl. I'll find you something else to nibble on besides dog food and crackers. Day 8 Michael furrowed his brows as he stood in the doorway of his walk-in pantry beside the fridge, arms crossed, then hands on his hips and back again, as he stared at the box of crackers, stacked neatly where it had sat the day before, the same crackers that he'd given the last of to Blue before dinner. Maybe it's the empty box just turned backward, he thought, but when he picked it up, it was full and unopened as it had been when he bought them. He swallowed and set them down carefully, backing up until he bumped into the opposite shelves. I know I didn't buy more than one, he whispered, and I know I finished the box yesterday. I threw the damn thing right over the edge with the rest of the garbage. He backed out of the pantry and the cold sweat dried as his mind raced, eyes flitting like flies over a corpse as he crossed his arms, then ran his fingers through messy hair. He ignored the rumble in his stomach and the smell of the coffee left on the counter as he swayed from one bare foot to another and breathed an idea aloud, ignoring Blue sitting next to the fridge. Nothing makes sense anyway. There's no water to come into the tap or electricity for the power, but here we are. What if... What if the food doesn't run out? He looked at Blue, and she quirked her head, eyes bright in the pale fog light of the morning. What if... If the food just comes back? Blue stopped panting like she understood. You're right, it's crazy, but... What exactly is sane about any of this? She groaned deep in her throat, which turned into a yawn as she slid down with a thump and set her head on her paws. I know. We need to test it. We tested the water, didn't we? He asked. So let's just... test it. He grabbed the box of crackers and went for the back door, then stopped, blinking and shaking his head before he turned to the half-rotten potatoes sitting in the bowl by the sink. No. If I'm going to do this, I might as well prep for failure. Nasty stuff, so it's no loss. Blue barked and walked up behind him, wagging her tail as he spun and returned the crackers to the pantry shelf, grabbed the bowl of potatoes, and half sprinted to the ring of lights near the edge, off now to conserve their bulbs. Blue bounded after him, slowing and whimpering behind as he took a deep breath 
and stepped over the lights to come within a foot of the edge. He looked out into the sea of churning cloudy fog, then down, 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 until he found the wall of sloping earth and ragged pipes. It was strange looking into a bottomless world, standing on an island in the midst of clouds like it were an ornament. It made his head spin, made his guts twist the longer he looked into it, made his pulse quicken. It wasn't right, and everything in him said that it was wrong, that what he saw was a lie, and that it couldn't be real. But no matter how many times he looked back to Blue or the house and back to check if he'd hallucinated everything, the fog was still there, and still as endless and hungry as before. He held the bowl out and turned it over in a second, watching the potatoes tumble down without slowing and crash through the mist, parting it briefly to reveal more fog beneath and more after that before the wounds closed. His arms stayed outstretched, eyes glued down, ears perked as he waited, hoped, for the thud or splat of their landing. But there wasn't one. There was only the wind that whipped his uncombed hair and pulled his pajamas like a flag in a storm. He set his mouth flat and sighed before he pulled sore arms back to his chest and stood straight, climbing over the lights and back into the house with Blue lingering where she'd been. He stopped at the lanai door, calling for her. She ignored him for a second as she stared out into the fog, quirking her head before she snapped and bounded happily back into the house. He smirked at her and chuckled. Something chirped above him. He jumped, nearly dropping the earthenware bowl to look up at the tiny thing that was almost a bird. It was black and shimmered like a cock's tail, but there were no feathers. Its flesh was smooth and glossy like it was wet. Its eyes were bright silver as it quirked its head to stare down at him. Great black beak opening in a high, sweet chirp that it shouldn't have had. It opened its wings, membranous things with ten digits fed through its flaps of skin, each ending in twisted nails too deformed to be claws. It stood upright and stretched itself up to its full height, something like a slender plucked chicken or crane, and let out a scream. Michael jumped again and bounded back inside, covering his ears and throwing the bowl aside as he shut the door on the shrill cry, like a little girl and desperate woman all at once. It stopped, and all the world was swallowed by silence, ear-ringing silence. Michael panted and cracked open the back door, peeking up and finding that the creature was gone before he shut it and leaned on the post, hand on his heart and an incredulous smile on his face. He looked to the bowl, not knowing what to expect, and it was still empty. He sighed with a small curse, to the bowl, the fog, the potatoes, and sank as he pushed off the door and headed for the garage to feed Blue. Well, at least I know. Besides, what could they have turned into? More vodka? He chuckled. Day 9. Michael sat up and groaned, hand on his head, ears ringing and the dark room hazy and blotchy with lights in his eyes. He cleared his throat and groaned at the throb before reaching for the glass of water and chugging until it was dry. He sighed, blinking the blurry patches of light away as he slid over the edge of the bed, looking through the window to the fog, churning and black as storm clouds ready to release their rain. I wonder if it does rain here, he thought. Then he stretched, glass still in hand as he fought the dull throb in his head and relaxed, body falling limp as he fell back and stared at the ceiling, brows furrowing as his dream of blue flashed behind his eyes. She barked up a wall somewhere inside the house, her paws almost speckled gunpowder as she jumped onto the wall and barked at something on the ceiling that wasn't there. He chuckled and sat back up to shuffle into the bathroom and go about his routine before descending the stairs to the coffee stand. He sighed as he fixed his too sugary drink and opened his eyes on the framed picture that he'd put on the shelf over the coffee maker. He sighed sadly at the frozen moment of happiness, of his still healthy wife and little Debbie sat in her mother's lap. He picked up the picture and stared with heavy eyes over a wide smile. 
he kissed the picture of his wife and daughter both, then returned them to the shelf and shuffled to the back door with his coffee and in nothing save his boxers. Blue bounded from the garage, nails clacking on the hardwood, and ran past him as he opened the door and let her fly through the lanai to the grass. He switched on the Christmas lights near the edge and turned on the outside lights. Be quick, Blue. Those things like the light and I don't want them coming around. She didn't respond like he almost wanted her to, but what else was he going to do? Who else would listen to him? He stood in the lanai door, scanning the skies and the little horizon of his little world for shifting clouds of flying things, for wind, for lightning that he'd never seen, for anything. He sipped his coffee, shivering in the cool dew of what passed from morning as a breeze puffed in his face and died just as fast. He crossed his arms and watched as Blue ran around the yard, her eyes nearly yellow in the outside lights when she stopped to look at him, her muzzle almost gray, like she'd stuck it to her eyes in the dirt. He called her inside and shut the door behind her. She trotted past him, panting like she'd run a marathon as she broke into the garage. He chuckled and strode after her, stopping in the doorway as she leapt her front paws onto the wall left of the door. She was looking up at something, still panting, ears forward. Did one of those bird things get in here? He thought, looking up, but it was just the edge of the ceiling. He looked back down at her when she barked at something that wasn't there. She barked again and again, even as he told her to be quiet. Then she stopped, tilted her head, and jumped down to look up at him like they just played her favorite game. He screwed up his forehead and laughed incredulously before he filled her food dish and called her over, turning around to find her in the same position before she started barking again. He called for her and told her to be silent, to heal, to sit, to come. She wouldn't listen, even when he shouted it. He stopped and watched her, eyes falling to her paws before she went quiet and jumped down to scarf up her food. He followed them and blinked, wiping his eyes before he kneeled next to her and brushed his fingers over her paws and the blue-gray discoloration on her fur. It wouldn't come off. It wasn't a stain. It was her fur. He stood and swallowed, clearing his throat before he made for the kitchen again, wincing as her nails clacked on the wall beside the door, barking up at nothing. He turned and found her in the same position as before, so he backed away, coffee forgotten as he leaned on the kitchen counter and watched her shadow, bark, 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 until she hopped down and padded past the kitchen for her bed in the living room. He quirked his head and chuckled, eyes wide and mouth tight as he set the coffee down and looked to the back door, half wondering if he brought the wrong dog inside. Then his eyes found the bowl that he'd left on the counter by the sink, the bowl he'd emptied over the edge, the bowl that was now full of new potatoes. He froze, fingers gripping the counter until his knuckles cracked and he decided to close the gap and lean over the bowl of fresh, clean, edible potatoes. He picked up one and cut it open with a knife that he didn't remember grabbing, smelling it, tasting it, crunching it between his teeth. It's real, he whispered, and dropped the potato and knife into the sink. He backed away, heart thumping and leaping as his guts churned around his spine. He balled up his fists as the disquieted shiver inside him turned to a live wire, the cold awe to red, yellow, white-hot iron that made his body tremble and blurred the world at its edges. He gritted his teeth and grabbed the bowl, turning and bursting through the house in flashes with other things in his arms that he didn't remember grabbing. He kicked the front door open and stormed to the edge of his world, screaming into the gray void as the light climbed, shouting into the bottomless skies as he threw one thing after another over the edge. Then he was back in the kitchen, in the pantry, raking food into his arms. Then he was at the edge again, his body taut and head throbbing around the blast of his incoherent voice. Then he stopped and panted, hair tossed in the mounting wind as he spread his fists wide and screamed, 
He screamed until his lungs were empty, so he breathed and screamed again. He shouted and cursed so long and hard that he bent himself in half. He stood there so long the dim light of early morning grew to midday. He cursed until his voice was gone, until his throat was raw and swollen, and he swore that he could taste blood. Then he panted, body aching and thrumming and pulsing. His skin was blister red, eyes wet and streaming tears, heart pounding against his ribs as he gasped for one hoarse breath after another. Then his knees buckled, and he fell to his side, pushing himself onto his hands and knees before he gasped a silent sob and pounded the grass beneath him. The words repeated over and over in his mind. I can't even... I'll never see them again. I have to live my life to death in this place. Day 11 He sat on the lanai in his jeans and gray beater. The thrum of the dryer lost in the background as he let his lunch sit half-eaten, waiting for Blue to loop back around. Ten seconds passed, and she bounded around the side of the house like she were on a track. She bolted faster than she'd ever run, black and blue-gray fur a smudge over the white-gray fog. She panted so hard it was almost a growl, mouth jammed open, yellow eyes wide, body rippling with newly built muscle. Then she was gone around the other side, and ten seconds later she came back around and back behind, and again, and again and again, never stopping, ripping up chunks of lawn. Blue. Blueberry. Come on, girl, let's go back inside. But she didn't stop. She just kept running. She ran when he stood to watch her and ordered her to stop. She ran when he went inside, thinking she'd stop when she saw him gone. She ran when he sat at the dining table to finish his lunch and fold the laundry. She ran and ran and ran. He came outside and stood in the lanai doorway when she whipped around the house, folding his arms as he wiped his mouth to hide the twist in his gut. She was gone and back again, flesh peeled away from her mouth in a disgusting, snarling pant, eyes yellow, fur a gray-blue blur that it hadn't been yesterday. He watched her run circles around the house, just like she had in his dream. Day 12. Michael lay on the couch, the blinds drawn to keep from seeing the flying things that almost looked like cranes, until they opened their mouths all the way down to their breast bones and let out a dozen slender tongues to feed. His mouth twisted at the memory, but he didn't move, just lay in a pair of basketball shorts and an undershirt, crook of his elbow over his eyes, mouth half open and body slow and weak. The whole world was silent, save for the wind, howling louder every hour, but it was still quiet enough for him to hear Blue's snoring from the pantry where she still lay. The memory flashed behind his eyes as his stomach growled, intestines roiling against one another like snakes as his gut ate itself. He'd gone downstairs like normal, and made his coffee like normal, but when he looked into the garage, Blue had been gone. Then he noticed the kitchen floor. A ruin of empty wrappers, boxes, and cans. Bowls had been overturned. Flour, sugar, coffee, everything was strewn across the floor. Even the fridge wasn't safe. It was shut by some miracle, but the insides were stripped bare save the splotches and smears of leftover scraps. He'd looked into the pantry, and there Blue lay, on her side, black coat speckled with gray, brown, and white beneath the coat of white flour and food crumbs and other wet things. Her stomach was distended like she had a litter of fifty, but she didn't whimper or whine. She just breathed slow and steady. She didn't even twitch in her sleep. He'd rush to her side at first, but she wouldn't wake no matter what he did, so he just stood back and watched her breathe, sleep, motionless, like she were hibernating just the occasional tremor from her muscle. Then he cleaned her mess and threw the scraps over the edge. At least it'll come back tomorrow, he'd said, after three hours of his stomach growling at him, no matter how much water he drank. But that didn't leave him much to eat. 
In fact, it left him next to nothing. A scrap of apple, some milk, and half a packet of crackers and eggs that she couldn't manage to pull out of the fridge. He ate it all in one meal. Now, at the end of the day and his food long since gone, he lay on the couch, in and out of sleep with strange dreams about Blue, her face and body rippling like water and changing more after each of the ripples. And she lay in the pantry, fat, full, and next to dead. I wonder if she'd come back the next day if she died, he thought and swallowed. I wonder if... I would. Day 16 Michael sat still as stone under the blankets, heart thudding in his temples, breath ragged as he stared with wide eyes down the dark upstairs hall. Something was inside. Claws clacked on the hardwood, slow and careful as it prowled the downstairs. Blue was gone, hopefully hiding somewhere in the garage. He jumped at a loud thud and crash, then a growl, low and alien like it came from more than one animal. He shifted under the blankets, sliding over the edge to tiptoe to his dresser beside the door, pulling a shotgun and ammo boxes from the back of the top drawer. He loaded the barrels on muscle memory and quietly cocked it, filling his pajama pockets with more shells. He swallowed and crept beside the railing, peeking over and finding nothing but shadows. He took a deep breath, his guts stealing together as the tremor in his hands died. Setting his jaw, he slipped downstairs, ignoring his dream of blue in the dark that he'd woken from. Halfway down the stairs, something creaked and burst in a cloud of splinters. He froze and aimed the double barrels at the kitchen, moving between both entry points, then bracing himself on the steps from a hissing roar outside. He flew down and through the kitchen as something tore the screen door off. He passed wooden debris and stopped on the lanai, barrels up, eyes scanning the floor, the ground, the sky. He reached behind him to the light switch and flipped them on, lighting up the void to reveal the gray fog around. There was nothing but shredded screen and a crumpled tin door half hanging from the lower hinge. He swept his sights down the lanai and froze as something moved at the back corner, behind the old couch. He rose on the balls of his feet and stalked forward, skin red with his thudding heart, body taut and ready. Then he furrowed his brows and lowered the barrels. Blue shivered behind the outdoor couch, whimpering and licking her lips as she found Michael and flicked between him and the fog outside. He licked his lips, uncocking the gun and dragging it over his arm as he rubbed his mouth, his dream flaring with each pulse. The dream of Blue stalking the house. The dream of her hunched and bent like a monster. The dream of her crawling upstairs and staring at him from the doorway, eyes shining with a human smile. He shivered, goosebumps spreading over his bare upper body from memory and damp. He looked down, ignoring the protruding bones from his now gaunt body. He shook his head, pushing the thoughts away as he knelt and held out his hand to Blue, smiling despite himself as she quivered behind the couch. It's okay, Blueberry. Come on out, girl. I'll protect you, I promise. Let's go inside, and I'll close it up. No monsters. He smiled like he would have to Debbie, but it seemed to work. Only a few minutes later, Blue was inside and in one of her beds as he cleaned up the splinters and examined the door. The bulk of it was intact, but the locks were completely ripped free. He sighed and fastened the knob with a bungee strap from the garage to the safety handles on the doorpost that he'd installed for his wife. It's not perfect, Michael said, kneeling beside Blue in the living room. But it'll hold for a few more hours until daylight, when I can see what I can scrap for wood. He petted down the length of her hulking body, eyes flicking between the flecks of white amid the gray-blue now dominating her coat. There was barely any black left on her. He swallowed and flinched back when she craned her head up and snarled, lips peeling back, too far back, and her yellow eyes dilating as her hair bristled like quills. He swallowed and looked over his shoulder, whirling around once he spotted it. A spider 
or something like it, had crawled out from under the couch opposite them. Ten legs skittered on the hardwood, its once fat body now slender and flexible, fleshy, covered in tiny hairs, and big as a cat. Michael jumped up, cursing when he remembered the gun was still in the kitchen. He balled up his fists as the thing scuttled closer, its eyes empty and glazed. Blind? Michael thought. Then he set his jaw, bent his legs, and pulled his arm back and up. A little more. Just a little more. It stopped, mandibles twitching as blue rose, her whole body trembling, fur standing up all over. The spider clicked its jaws and hissed, lifting its mouth parts up and revealing the toothy maw, champing its jaws with a shink like swords. Michael's open hand crashed down with a silent breath, flattening the creature as it screamed and squirmed. He drove his forearm down, hovering over its body as he lifted his foot and stomped, driving his heel deeper and deeper until the screams faded with breaking bones, and the floor, like himself, was covered in blue-green blood. Michael panted, stepping back as he wondered aloud if that could have broken down the door. Day 20 Michael crept backward, wearing a smiling mask as he left the grass of the backyard for the concrete floor of the lanai. Blue, what was left of her, prowled around the Christmas lights in the dark, her shoulders rolling like a stalking lioness, her back too tall, her body too muscled. Her shadow moved in the fog, yellow-silver eyes staring, her once black coat now camouflaged to the mist. He swallowed, then whirled, bolting the last five steps to the back door. He spun and bashed the door shut. It slammed in place as he fell to the floor and clawed back up, setting three planks of wood into the makeshift slots on the posts. He stepped back as what used to be blue roared and broke into the lanai, claws scraping down the outside as she beat against the wood of the door. Michael panted, eyes flicking to the window above the sink and the metal bars that he'd screwed inside from the shelves in the garage. With another blink he spun on his boot heels as Blue stopped pounding on the door and her hyena-like outline rushed past the window. Michael dashed for the front door, bracing it with the same wooden panels as the back door, six of them taken from the front porch rails. Then Blue pounded on the door screaming half-mad like a woman and a jackal and a fighting cat. He, he slid the last plank in place and fell back, staring at the pounding front door as he crept back into the living room, staying on hand and knee to keep himself below the front window sills. He looked between the three windows, all barred with the same metal poles from the shelves in the garage, and panted, heart racing as Blue circled the house. She screamed, and it almost sounded like a growl or hiss deep from her guts. Her shadow splashed across the living room from the window above him. He froze, pressing into the wall and swallowing, breath quivering as he shut his eyes and opened them again to banish the memory of her watching him from the foot of his bed. The dream and memory bled together, making her eyes glow and her skin ripple, fur changing from hair to quill to scales and back as she smiled like a human smiles. He shivered and crept on all fours back to the kitchen, blocking out the flashes of her shadow prowling the house when he got up with his shotgun, the sight of her back growing taller each morning, her coat lighter, her muscles bigger. He ignored the memory of her smile in daylight when he told her a joke and she barked something like a laugh. Her lips curled like a person but peeled over fangs, covering her snout in a snarl that wasn't threatening only for her raised eyebrows. He pulled himself into the pantry and shut the door, turning on the first flashlight before he took up the shotgun and readied his ammo, checking the pistol strapped to his belt and the extra magazines in his jean pockets. He steadied his breathing as what used to be blue howled and screamed, circling the house and pounding the doors, the walls, the garage. His hairs stood on end. Oh God, I didn't brace the garage doors. But they didn't come crashing open. The house was secure and Michael stayed in the pantry as Blue growled and hissed and screamed half-human noises, circling the house all night long. 
Hey y'all, thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this story and stick around for part two. Heck, even part three. If you enjoy what I do here and want to see more, give this a like and comment. Subscribe, turn on the bell so that you don't miss when I upload, and very important, share your favorite video of mine. Every little bit helps, especially this early on. Alright, I'll see y'all next time. Bye.